before coming up with the time management plan, think about what the objective of your life or career is. It's like knowing where to, how to get to a destination, we need to know where to go to first. And so I define my personal mission statement as to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business you get more information from the fact that there might be six or eight different opinions out of there rather than if everybody had to say exactly the same thing. Hello and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Today we have an extraordinary guest an individual whose mission is to drive companies to balance profit and purpose and to help individuals fulfill their potential. London Business School Professor of Finance and Academic Director for Corporate Governance, Alex Edmonds. Awarded a double first from the University of Oxford, Alex started his career working for Morgan Stanley in London and New York before finding his calling and undertaking a PhD in financial economics at Sloan MIT, where he was a Fulbright Scholar before then taking up positions teaching at Wharton and now at London Business School. Alex has spoken to the World Economic Forum in Davos, presented to the World Bank, and has spoken to millions via the TED stage. A rigorous, data-driven academic, Alex has published in a multitude of leading publications, including the Harvard Business Review, and has appeared on Bloomberg, the BBC, CNN, CNBC, in The Economist, the FT, and the Wall Street Journal. If this weren't impressive enough, Alex has published a Financial Times Book of the Year named Grow the Pie and received multiple teaching awards while at London Business School and at Wharton. In this conversation, we get a deep insight into Alex's thinking on how to rehabilitate economics for a more sustainable world, the value of experts, ESG and investing, and the art of inspiration. It's one that you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. First, Alex, thank you so much for inviting us into your home here. It's beautiful. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time out to be yeah, speaking to us. You're very welcome, Chris. It's great to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, first off, I would just like to um, talk generally about yourself and like kind of curious uh, as to what drives you and about your, your, your passions and just a way of kind of framing the conversation. I understand that one of your favorite uh, books is um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And from that, you've taken inspiration to um, develop a personal mission statement. Could you care to kind of tell us what that personal mission statement might be and how it kind of feeds into your, your, your work of purpose? Yes, absolutely. So Seven Habits is a book which is, um, much of it is known to be about time management, but time management is with respect to a given set of objectives. So one of the principles is to begin with the end in mind. So before coming up with the time management plan, think about what the objective of your life or career is. It's like knowing where to, how to get to a destination, we need to know where to go to first. And so I define my personal mission statement as to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business. And so there's two um, aspects to it. First, you do want to make sure that whatever you are, are stating is based on research. So really important topics like climate change, that does attract a lot of people and, and with, with very good intentions, right? Given climate change is so important, people do want to contribute to it, but sometimes you might be contributing without some research behind it. And so this might lead to shooting from the hit rather than saying what's based on evidence. But also the second part is to use research for the practice of business. And so this um, highlights that the research I want to do is not purely for academic purposes, not just to be published in, in the top academic journals, but to be attuned towards real world problems, which is why I very much appreciate interviews like this one. Fantastic. Cool. And kind of tying a, just a couple of uh, those kind of threads together, one is um, your wish for rigor, and another is your, your most recent kind of TED talk, uh, which is entitled um, What to Trust in the Post-Truth World. Yeah. Could you try and kind of tease out why we should be trusting you today? Yes. Um, so, so what what do we want to trust um, to, to begin with? Well, normally with a, with a TED talk, it's a great 
platform to market your own research. But I wanted to talk about the importance of research in general, because how often people respond to research is whether they like the findings or not, rather than actually whether it's rigorous. So rather than just giving a particular talk on a topic where the response to that talk would depend on whether people like the findings, I thought to make it a, a case for, for research in general. Um, and so I think for something like, like um, climate or sustainability, it is important to um, make sure that the person has done a lot of work on it for, for a while. So I first started working sustainability um, in 2006, 2007, so when I was finishing my PhD at MIT. And why that's interesting is, is back then there was not so much of an interest in sustainability or ESG. In fact, my paper on it didn't mention the phrase ESG even once. So I didn't write that paper in order to um, satisfy some demand for uh, doing work in ESG. Uh, it's just something I, I, I cared about and I, I wanted to, to research. And also it meant that I was not um, under pressure to find a particular result. So nowadays, if you show that ethical companies perform better, then yes, you're going to be more likely to get coverage than if you showed the opposite. But back then, because it wasn't something where there was a strong view, um, then there was no pressure to find something one way or the other. That being said, it's quite nice of you, Chris, to say, well, why you should ask why people should listen to me. But there's certain things that people should not listen to me about. So in particular, for, for climate science, there are some questions on it which a, a climate scientist or an engineer might uh, know better than me. So is carbon sequestration something going to be effective? Well, I, I just don't know. Is it going to be possible to, to, um, to, to, to fire um, uh, pellets into the atmosphere to, to reflect um, the sun's rays? That's not something that I'm an expert in. I, I do understand the financial elements of it, but um, the climate is unfortunately such a big problem um, that we need a diversity of perspectives. And I understand one of the great things about your series is you're trying to look at people um, across different areas of business, not just finance. But I think even beyond business, there's so many other aspects of, of, of knowledge and science that that need to be um, need, need to be learned from. No, absolutely. Yeah, we. Um the, the, the series is, is no kind of solo voice, it's all an orchestra, like lots of people talking about their own individual areas of expertise and trying to put it all together and understanding that there is no one solitary answer and no one person can possibly embody all of the, all of the, you know, the different questions and perspectives. Mm -hmm. so, um, but maybe um, could you give us a little bit of advice on how we can be trusting better and how we, wh how, how, what type of frames should we should be looking at to try and make better decisions in, in terms of who we trust and who we don't? Yeah, so I think there's, there's a couple of things that you can look at. Firstly, in terms of um, something that has written a paper or a study. And second, in terms of the authors, the actual people, if you're choosing to interview somebody rather than um, read a, a quite um, academic, potentially, paper. I think first, in terms of, of, of papers and studies, to see, well, are these published in the top peer-reviewed journals. So why is that interesting? Well, in order to be published in something like Science or Nature or the British Medical Journal, or in my field like the Journal of Finance, you have to be peer-reviewed. So what this means is that um, the editors of a journal, and I was the editor of a journal for six years, you ask the leading experts of a field what they think about it to make sure that the actual study is rigorous, that the claims were fully backed up by the analysis which has been which was done. And so there were times when as an author myself I had to tone down some claims which might have been striking, might have sort of grabbed attention, but they were not fully nailed by the analysis. Now I have to admit that peer review is not perfect, right? There are some times in which papers can get published and then it's later found to be overturned. For example, I'm sure many of the listeners would have known Amy Cuddy's TED talk on power poses. That was published in, in an academic journal, but it was later found to be not replicable. Um, but this is also why the idea of scientific consensus is useful, right? It's often not that one paper will have the last word, um, it may well be that the body of evidence, where you take lots of papers published in top journals, then that you'll use that to form consensus. So the journal that published Cuddy's initial research, they were good enough to publish the, the replications which actually um, weren't um, falling, weren't supporting it. So yes, we do want to look at papers published in a top journal, but not just one paper, but the body of knowledge. And one thing that I try to do um, is to, to convey what I believe the scientific community views about sustainability in general. When we were kind of organising this this chat, uh, you started a really interesting conversation about um, people people's positions to be able to, to to be able to to be able to talk and be able to educate on issue on important issues like climate. 
And it seemed to me that, you're, that you, you thought that something as serious as climate change should be left to, to the experts. Would you care to kind of to, to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, so I think, so f first, so, so let me just clarify. I, I don't think that I or anybody should be a gatekeeper to say, oh, you're allowed to say something and you're not allowed to say something. So this is absolutely not to exclude people from conversations, but it's just to make clear that uh, when people are, are, are giving insights on it, then it's so to make it clear what your expertise is, is, is based on. So for me, my expertise is, is, is based on finance, but not on climate science. So there's certain things for me, which I don't think I have expertise in, in, in saying. And simply, if you think about some of the, the, the biggest um, voices in climate right now, um, you might have, say, Noam Chomsky, who, who I greatly respect. He's a professor at MIT, where I did my PhD, but he's mainly known for his expertise in linguistics. That's not to say that he can't say stuff on climate, because an intelligent person could well read up about um, uh, climate science and, 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 and retell this in, intelligently. Um, but it may well be that others who've worked on the issue said of um, more, more deeply and for a while might be good authorities. So I recently read uh, Vaclav Smil, who, who wrote uh, How the World Really Works, and so there's somebody who has worked in science for a, a while. And so he understands, okay, there's trade-offs here, there's certain industries where uh, it's going to be really difficult to wean ourselves off these industries. What that means is the uh, idea of we can just suddenly stop uh, using energy is, is going to be unlikely. That, this is why, again, it might be um, adaptation, unfortunately, which will um, be the more, uh, the more f a focus of efforts than, than purely mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, I had a conversation with, uh, with your colleague uh, Rajiv Chandy um, a couple of weeks back. Uh, really, really interesting conversation, really, really interesting guy. And uh, one of his great kind of sources of hope um, in, the, in the whole kind of cl climate change discussion was a part of like his his specialization, which is entrepreneurship in in emerging markets and the developing world. He expected to see quite um, significant amounts of change and innovation coming from the the global south, mm. from people who are having to deal with you know the effects of climate change yeah. on a day by day basis. Um, but I also understand your your need for and your your desire for academic rigor. Um, how do we balance the the information and knowledge that's going to, that, that will that will come from parts of the parts of the world that mightn't have the same levels of education and access to those type of that, that type of rigor that, you, that you're talking about. So how do you balance rigor rigor versus um, entrepreneurship in, in diff different parts of the world? I don't see any conflict between those actually. So I don't think innovation is based on academic research. People innovate because they have great inspiring ideas. You don't innovate from because you read academic papers. So so why I say academic papers should be used is if you want to make statements such as what is the effect of carbon emissions on the cost of capital? Right, that's a statement where you can do an academic study on it. But I think innovations are quite separate things. So I, I absolutely would, would think that the Global South has just as much or more ability to, to innovate as other people. You, you, I, I've not, how, how do people come up with these great ideas? It's not through looking at the academic evidence. The academic evidence is instead to say, well, what is the cause effect relationship between a couple of variables? But that's not what an innovator does. And, and I think the people who are closest to the problem, probably best place to come up with these innovations. Right. So uh, kind of tying this discussion into uh, one of your kind of recent papers, um, applying economics, not gut, uh, to, to ESG. Mm -hmm. Um, can you explain the kind of the, the premise of that uh, paper and what it might yeah. um, suggest for for climate change, particularly? Yes, absolutely. So um, one of the big pressures nowadays is to teach as much ESG and sustainability related content as possible. The new Financial Times rankings, for example, um, is is grades uh, business schools on the percentage of. Um, core hours that you use for sustainability teaching. That's self-reported, that's a separate issue, but let's now take, let's assume we take the data as given. Why I think that's somewhat problematic is it, it, it tries to divorce and pigeonhole sustainability climate content from mainstream business content. And so the mainstream financial principles are always about the long term to begin with. So if we think about what does Finance 101 teach you, well, the present value of an investment is the present value of all future cash flows from now right into the future. Now, maybe when these frameworks were first developed, that might have been to value a car factory, which huge upfront investment, 
long-term payoff, but absolutely it will also uh, apply to renewable energy or other sustainability topics such as investing in a more uh, diverse and inclusive workforce. And so why I wanted to write that paper is people think um, we should now just scrap all the existing business textbooks and do something new because what um, we've been taught teaching for the last few decades is just not fit for purpose in 2023. And I have an incentive to argue that because um, the textbook principles of corporate finance by Brealey, Myers and Allen, which I'm sure many people um, learnt from, I'm now a co-author of that in the 14th edition, and I have tried to incorporate sustainability content, so I should claim I've completely rewritten the book. But I haven't. Right? What I've done is I've taken the book and there's many of the existing tried and tested finance principles can be applied and adapted to issues such as climate and sustainability uh, more generally. And I think this is important because why the title of the paper is Applying Economics Not Gut Feel is that people shoot from the hip and say stuff which sounds good when that might not actually um, be um, correct. And let's just give some concrete examples. I know I've talked in abstract terms. So the first of them is this concept of shareholder value. So there's concerns that shareholders only care about the short term. And if that's the case, then we should completely change the way that companies are run. So how are companies run? Directors are in elected by investors. Their fiduciary duty is to uh, investors in many countries. But if investors are short term, we don't want that. Let's have in said workers or somebody else um, elect the directors. But shareholder value, as I mentioned, is an inherently long-term concept, Like right? The shareholder value of a company is the present value of all future cash flows. That is true not just in theory, it's true in practice. So why are companies like Tesla valued so highly? It's because of the long-term prospects. And this is why, indeed, it's often investors who are persuading companies to go faster and further on climate and other sustainability issues like DEI than others. So I don't think there's so much of a problem with shareholders. Now, there might be particular types of shareholders who are short-termists, and there should be things done to address that. But we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, well, let's completely get rid of shareholders having um, a, a say in, in who the directors are. Another issue which often people think about is um, how sustainability affects the cost of capital. So there's people who argue that traditional approaches to evaluate investment, like net present value, they're all automatically biased against risky projects like renewable energy. Why? Because the risk affects the discount rate. The greater the discount rate, the lower the net present value, the less likely you are to take a particular investment. So let's not use net present value, let's just invent some other way of evaluating an investment. But Finance 101 tells you there's two different types of risk. There's idiosyncratic or specific risk, which is unique to a company, and there's market-wide systematic risk. And while developing climate, oh, let's say carbon capture technology, that is risky, but we don't know whether the technology will work or not, that is probably not correlated with the rest of the economy. So whether the technology works or not, that's not going to be linked to whether the economy is a boom or a recession. And that will be linked to many other sustainability issues. For example, if you were to invest in a cancer cure, you might succeed or you might not, but that again is not correlated with the state of the economy. On the downside, if you fail to invest in sustainability issues and you have problems like um, Wells Fargo and fake bank accounts or Rio Tinto and Duke and George, again, those are idiosyncratic factors. They are not necessarily linked to the state of the economy. And so why was all of this important is if indeed these projects are risky, but the risk is diversifiable and it's idiosyncratic, it should not affect the cost of capital. So actually net present value should give a big green light in order to support these projects, because as long as your shareholders are diversified, then they're not actually worried so much about the risk that this technology does not work. And so what I try to teach in the textbook, I try to teach in my LBS classes, is the correct application of these finance principles, is that it should only be systematic risk that goes in the denominator. And therefore, if you're a financial manager, or an investor sort of trying to evaluate the company, you should not um, penalise a project like a carbon capture technology for having idiosyncratic risk that can be diversified away.
Okay, perfect. And that brings us really quite neatly to uh, to your your, your, your book, um, Grow the Pie, mm-hmm. you know, Financial Times Book of the Year, yes. and uh, phenomenally successful. Uh, would you uh, tell us a little bit about the you know, the underlying premise of it? Absolutely. So let me explain what what the pie is to begin with. So why does a finance professor write a book with pie in the title? So you, the pie is what the value is the value that a company creates, and we kind of think about the pie being divided between investors in the form of profit and society in the form of fair taxes, fair wages, and also lower carbon emissions. Okay, So anything you can do, it can go to society or investors. And often people have what's known as a pie-splitting mentality or a fixed pie mentality. If the pie is fixed, the only way that you can increase the slice to investors is if you reduce the pie that goes to society. So what does this mean? It means that if you want to maximize profits, pay workers as little as possible. And you learn in an Economics 101 class during your PhD, you maximize profits by holding the workers down to the outside option. You never pay them more than the outside option. And similarly, you might maximize profits by um, polluting as much as you can um, get, can, can get away with without having a, a, a fine and so on. Now, but what I wanted to highlight in the book was the idea that the, of, of the pie growing mentality is that the pie is not fixed. If you're investing in your stakeholders, ultimately that will benefit shareholders. So in terms of employees, by investing in them by providing them more pay than you can get away with, and not just pay, but meaningful work, skills development, mentorship, they become more motivated and more productive and more likely to stay, and therefore it will be that shareholders can be better off in the long term. And the whole idea of win-wins, that might sound nice and too good to be true, so that's why the heartbeat of that is evidence suggesting that that is the case for um, employee satisfaction. That was the study I alluded to, which I started in 2007. And the same principles could also apply to climate if you are decarbonising even before you need to, because there's not full government intervention. That does place you well for if there is the hope for government's response, then you don't need to suddenly adapt it because you're already adapted. Your competitors who sort of just waited until the last minute, they can't suddenly adapt and you're going to be beating them. So why I said might earlier is that that I don't, the evidence on that is still relatively mixed because we haven't yet seen the government response. We would like it to be when there is a carbon tax, then the emitting companies are actually going to be doing worse. But actually right now, the evidence we have so far suggests that if anything, actually companies that emit more carbon deliver higher long-term returns, which I wish it was not true, but um, that might be because they're able to get away with the pollution that they're undertaking, which again highlights the importance of government action, as, as Stuart Kirk and many others have, have said. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's also um, the historic and deep, deep-rooted um, advantages that the, the, the high carbon company, mm. like the, the, the old old world companies have, mm. like they've, they've got more money, they're mm. more, they're better organised, and they're better able to influence uh, governments. But why I, I wanted to write that book is I think for far too long people have thought about uh, sustainability issues as nice to have, as sort of moral and ethical issues just for ESG people within a company that's an ESG specialist, within a fund it's an ESG investor, but mainstream hard-nosed capitalists like a CEO or a chief investment officer shouldn't care about this. Um, But I wanted to highlight that actually this is not just a moral and ethical issue, this is a business and financial issue. So even if you do not care at all about society, you only care about maximising profits, you should take these issues really seriously. If you're a car company, you'd like to move from petrol cars to electric cars. Now, most people want to do that because they care about climate change. But even if you don't care about climate change, this is the economics of the way in the world's working. In many cases, what is good for society is actually good for the company. Not true in all cases. And unfortunately, the lack of a global carbon tax means that with with climate, it's actually sometimes there is a way of maximising profits by exploiting society. But on other other issues, particularly the employee issues, these are things which are aligned. And I wanted to give the business case for sustainability, not just the moral and ethical case. So morals and ethics are really important, but when the rubber hits the road, it may well be that morals and ethics sometimes are seen as second order 
compared to the importance of, of, of profits, particularly in a downturn where you might need to survive. But what I want to highlight is that there's actually commercial reasons behind this. So it doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. And what really makes me unhappy in the US is this polarization. It's something that Republicans should oppose and Democrats should support. But I think everybody should support something which is going to increase the long-term success of a business. Yeah, yeah. And ESG itself is such a yeah, there's so many different measures and matrix of ESG. You break down each of the E, the S, and the G, mm. and there's so many different different subsets. Like you can have two funds doing exactly, you know, doing fundamentally opposite things, but both of them call themselves the ESG funds. It's um, it's it's uh, you can understand why there's um, yeah, confusion. Yeah, I think the term ESG is really puzzling to begin with. So, so why did the term come up uh, to come to place? It's not really clear because you think the environmental and social is to affect wider society, whereas governance is often to improve shareholder value. So often people use the term ESG, but they often just refer to, to the ENS to begin with. And even within the ENS, there are potentially trade-offs. As, as I discussed, it might be that you're doing something like shutting down a polluting plant, which is good for the environment, but it might be bad for workers, which is the S. And even within the environmental issues, it might be, we think, say, um, electric um, cars are going to be a solution to um, greenhouse gas emissions, but they require lithium batteries and that requires mining. And so there are some potential trade-offs um, there. And I also think that the other reason why ESG is, is a, a, a dangerous term, which is why one of my recent papers is called the end of ESG, suggesting not to use it, is it suggests that it is just a niche thing for just ESG professionals, whereas I believe that it should be something that all business people take into account. So I don't see these things as being ESG investing. It's just investing. Right? If you want to take into account the long-term potential of a company, yes, you look into its factories and its machines and its brand, but you also look at how is a company treating its workers, what's its relationship with its customers, is it actually environmentally sustainable? Because that might be something which even right now will affect customers' willingness to buy from you and in the future might affect your profitability if there's government regulation on these issues. Um, so I, I'm calling it the end of ESG, not because I'm an anti-ESG person, it's the opposite. I believe that ESG is so important that it should not be seen as, as a rather as a niche issue. Um, and then that led to the follow-up, the applying ESG economics, not gut feel paper, arguing that actually mainstream finance techniques have always been about trying to maximise long-term value. So it's a bit sort of artificial to divvy up things into ESG content and non-ESG content. And if you do that, some people will pay attention to the latter and close their ears to the former. All of these things are important content, which any business practitioner or business academic should be wary of and mm -hmm. mindful of. Um, one of the issues about, um, about trying to score well on ESG, I guess, is, um, is, is it's inherently subjective. Yes. Like if you're just trying to measure yourself on profits, at yeah. least on its face, it's objective. Mm -hmm. and it's on its face, you can, um, you, can, you can have a number and see whether one number is bigger than the other. But on your ESG metrics, you've got issues with, um, well, what is, the, what is the most important thing you want to be focusing mm. on and how well you're doing on it? Um, trying to put putting numbers on these things is very difficult. Mm. Um, how do you deal with that type of issue? I think the most important way to deal with the issue is to recognise and to embrace and acknowledge the subjectivity. So there are people who argue that ESG standards are a panacea. Once we find a unified way to measure everything, then the problem will go away because if we can measure ESG, we can call out the winners and, and call out the, the losers. But I think ESG is intangible. It's inherently something which is very difficult to measure. So as an analogy, let's take US education 20 years ago, where people wanted to have common standards for school performance. Why? It's a pretty similar narrative to what we have now. If we have common measures, there's going to be accountability for teachers. It's also going to drive capital allocation. School districts know which schools to fund. Just like now, investors are saying we can put our money into the more sustainable companies, but only if we know who's most sustainable. And so what did we have? We had standardized tests and we know the outcome. You taught to the test. Right? You were able to deliver performance on the tested elements but not the broader aspects of teaching, such as critical thinking, 
a love of learning, uh, ability to respect authority and so on. Instead, you just were able to just repeat fragmented bits of information to be tested. And I think this will be the, also the case here for, for various ESG dimensions. For example, let's take diversity, equity, inclusion, something I obviously care about um, being an ethnic minority. Now, you can do well on diversity scores by just hiring ethnic minorities or, or women or whatever demographic statistic is, is being measured just to tick a box. But is that measuring whether you're included and, 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 and are feeling valued? I don't think so. And indeed, I have a work and, pro, and process paper where we're actually looking at true DEI and linking it to diversity from a demographic um, sense. And these are not correlated at all. So yes, you can play to the measures in terms of we've got X percentage of women or minorities. But does that mean that you're going to be inclusive? Uh, not necessarily. Now, one counter argument is, OK, maybe you can't do it for something intangible like um, diversity, equity, inclusion, but you can do it for some things. And why don't we do it for things that you can measure? Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. For example, with climate change, we understand there are carbon emissions. There's scope one and scope two and scope three. Let's force all companies to do this. And indeed, many companies disclose this. But actually, um, there is um, still issues with the data. So if you think of some of the main data providers, such as TrueCost, right? So um, they actually report not just disclosed data directly disclosed by the company, they also need to estimate the data because not all companies report it and they have to estimate the data by looking at other peers within the same industry of, of a similar size. And there are studies showing that the link between carbon emissions and long-term shareholder returns, that differs according to whether you use the full sample from true cost, or you look at only the disclosed emissions and not the estimated ones. So even the data set that everybody thinks to be the gold standard in, on carbon emissions is not something which might be fully reliable because some of these might be estimated. And you might think, well, why don't we just look at the ones which are purely disclosed by the company? And again, this is when I talk to more people at the ground level who know more the data gathering than me, is actually a company disclosing its carbon emissions. They are making a large amount of assumptions in doing that. It's not that they look at every single factory and measure the emissions of every factory, they are sampling a couple of them and sort of trying to make some aggregation. It is not like um, profits, where profits, there's quite an easy way of aggregating it. If you've got a company with lots of different divisions, they're all reporting their profits and you're pretty sure that the overall measure is the sum of its parts. That is not necessarily the same for, for, for climate. That's not to say that we should just ignore it. There is still some accuracy. It may be that you're correct within the range of sort of 50 to 70, but whether it's 55 or 65, you're not so, so clear. But I think it's just to try to measure what we can, but understand the limitations of that measure. So it's still fine to look at diversity. Just know that that might not capture inclusion and equity. Let's look at something like carbon emissions, but let's acknowledge that that might um, not um, capture um, the, the, the true, even if it's disclosed by the company, it might not capture uh, the position accurately. There also could be like second or third order effects which you're not not recognising. One interesting way of looking um, through this whole this whole area is the idea of kind of a, an augmented net present value. Mm. Could you kind of unpack that a uh, little bit for us? Yes, there is indeed a sensible logic behind augmented net present value. So why? What I claimed earlier was that net present value takes into account all the future cash flows of a company, so we don't actually need to change net present value. But one of the counter arguments is if there are things like externalities, do we need to take them into account because even long term net present value won't, they will only look at the effect on the cash flows of the company. So there are some initiatives to try to quantify the externalities that you are um, producing. Um, by looking at the externalities that you're creating, converting this into a dollar number, and then adding that to the net present value. And so, there are exam for example, there might be um, certain products and services which extend the value of human life. So it could be drugs, it could be seat belts, it could be education about um, alcohol-related violence and so on. And there are frameworks that I've looked at which will try to look at, well, what's the number of lives that you will sell, you'll, you'll save, and what's the value of a life? But this, um, to me, leads to rather uncomfortable conclusions, is that, sadly, the estimates that are used of the value of life depend on the person's life expectancy 
and the person's income. Um, and this will then automatically lead to the Global South having a low financial value of life um, compared to somebody in the US, because you say, well, the value of the life is, or well, how much money they can make. And that, to me, is very uncomfortable. Um, so, yes, as a professor, I, I, I understand the value of data. Yes, let's quantify things when we can. But I, that, well, this is why earlier I said, let's try to embrace subjectivity when things that cannot be valued, then, then, then just don't, don't try to value them. Leave that in the non-financial term. So if, some, if, if Project A saves 100 lives in the US and Project B saves 1,000 lives in the global south, just stop there. Don't try to convert that into um, a dollar number to add to your net present value. Now, there are some people who say, well, unless I can convert everything to one single number, how can I do a comparison? Because it's not apples to apples. If one project makes more money but saves fewer lives, then do I prefer that to one that makes less money and saves more lives? But throughout life, we always make decisions based on more than one criteria. Now, there will obviously be a value judgment there because different people will have different views as to how to trade off uh, the money versus, let's say, the effect on the environment, which are not captured in long-term value. But again, throughout life, different people um, will have different subjective opinions, uh, and, and yet they are still able to make decisions. So I think that that's the, the, the case that should happen. How can we guide the subjectivity? So what I have in chapter three in the book is a couple of principles in order to make this not completely arbitrary. I'm not going to go through all three of them, but one of them that I'll talk about is the idea of comparative advantage. So what do I mean by this is that there's loads of problems in the world, but companies, it's not your responsibility to solve every single one of the world's problems, but to focus on the issues that you have most expertise in solving. For example, I have to admit that I, I do not spend my weekends serving in, in, in a soup kitchen or helping out in a homeless shelter. That's not that I don't care about homelessness, but that doesn't really use my comparative advantage. Whereas if I was to give a Gresham lecture, which can be viewed by um, hundreds of thousands of people, that does use my expertise. At the, the heart of the um, you know, pinomics is uh, the, the dynamics and the, and the trade-off, most people would say, between um, shareholder value and stakeholder value. Mm. But uh, you, you yourself have pushed back against that. And, uh, and, but what, what's, what is the, um, the issue that you have with the, with the wording and the, the phraseology? Yes. So, so often, like now, right now, often shareholder value is a dirty word. Right? If you want to be accepted in polite society, you, you need to say how much you despise shareholder value and the ideas of Milton Friedman. Why? Because number one, shareholder value is short termist. Number two, shareholder value is at the expense of stakeholders. And I believe that both of those premises are incorrect. Number one, shareholder value is a long term concept, as I said right at the start of this conversation. And number two, there's many elements of shareholder value which are aligned with stakeholder value. So how can a company be successful in the long term? It has to treat its work as well. It has to make great products that customers want to buy and also provide after-sales service and, the, and have a great reputation for not causing addiction and, 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 and so forth. And similarly for um, the environment, you, um, if you have a good environmental record, people are more willing to buy from you. Now, it's not always the case that shareholder value and stakeholder value are fully aligned in every case, sometimes there might not be full government intervention. For example, tobacco companies have been successful. One might argue that their product has caused, well, not one argue, it's, it's clear that their product causes addiction. And to your lobbying point, why is it that this has not been regulated out? One might argue that actually they're, they're overly powerful in, in lobbying. The same is true with, with pollution. There is not a fair carbon tax. So there are some trade-offs and there are cases in which shareholder value and stakeholder value are not fully aligned. So it's not always win-wins, but I think sort of the amount of win-wins that you see are much more common than one might think. It might be sort of 80 to 90 percent in terms of alignment, which is again why I say, and you've also asked in your questions, it is just good business sense for a company to think about its long-term consequences and its long-term effects on society, because these are all things which will affect the financial sustainability, not just your social contribution. Yeah, yeah, and in and in a lot of ways, like I'm sure 80, 90 percent uh, of that, so I do do agree with. But I think they do have issues with the 10, 20 percent, mm -hmm. like in a you know um, 
globalized and unequal world, mm. you can find um, shareholders who are stakeholders. Let's say, like, take a kind of um, you know, European oil and gas company. Mm. You know, you'll have um, a shareholder who is a stakeholder by virtue of you know being in part of the pe pension part as well and benefiting from, ta from taxes and uh, wider society. So, like, they're they're can play, play both roles. But you're going to have other stakeholders who are. Um, in other parts of the world where the, um, the, the, the materials are being extracted, mm -hmm. um, leaving uh, with, with the profits being brought back up mm -hmm. to, to home turf mm -hmm. um, at a price that doesn't adequately compensate for the, for, for the pollution and the, the, the lack of resources mm -hmm. you know, back, you know, back in, in the global south. I know you accept that there's, there, there's a 10 and 20% 20, 20 where, where there is a problem, but that is a problem, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And this is why I think it's important to recognise, as I've said throughout this conversation, we need government intervention. We can't just leave it for capitalism to sort out itself. So there are people who promote this idea of universal ownership theory, which is not any theory I've seen sort of formally proven or, 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 or even formally stated, but the idea is that if there are shareholders who own stakes in every company, they will suddenly sort of solve the problem because they will take some of these externalities into account. For example, if you own both the energy company and the real estate um, beachfront company, you will tell the energy company to stop polluting so that the beachfront properties are not going to be flooded. But that just doesn't make a full sense to me because what is a universal owner to begin with? Often people look at sovereign wealth funds, but they might be focused on owning just things within that country. Will they necessarily care about the effect on the global south? No. And I don't think there are universal owners who own every single thing in the, in, 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 in the entire world. And also, there are many externalities which don't have financial consequences. So let's say that we make a particular species extinct. Well, if that species was not something that we were using for food or for pollination, um, there's not a financial consequence. But does it make life far less less beautiful? Absolutely. Um, the, the value of the coral reefs, uh, okay, one might say, well, there's value to that because you can have tourism and that tourism generates money. But also one of the big principles of economics, going back to applying economics, not gut feel, is consumer surplus. A value to society is far more than the value that you, you pay in terms of having a, 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 a holiday to look at the coral reef. So you can't just look at the amount of financial value in order to look at the value of something for, for, for society. So I, I think that because you have all of these other consequences, the externalities, you can't just leave it for investors to, to, to sort out. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Friedman a little uh, earlier on and his you know, famous theories about... Um, well, slightly misquoted theories on um, the only requirement of the firm is to be uh, pursuing profits. Uh, yeah, so he said the too. social responsibility of business is to, um, is to pursue profits, and so it's to increase its profits. And why that important thing is, is changed is the social responsibility. He says, well, actually, it's good for society if a company goes after profits. Why? Because if you go after profits, you're going after signals of what society cares about. Going back to the early example, why would you make electric cars, not petrol cars? Well, because the demand for electric cars is higher, reflects where, where what society is wanting. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were going to ask something after the sure, definition. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for, for that. It's important. Um, and you were referencing Friedman as uh, someone who has been kind of misunderstood. But one of the one of the issues with Friedman, um, at least at least in my mind, is you need to be able to rationally uh, price things mm -hmm. and and put in put in like a. You know, a you know, do dollar value on on externalities and, uh, and the rest, but since Friedman's time, there's been the advent of the whole be whole behavioral economics cycle, um, mm. where where you know, the assumption of rationality isn't as strong as it was. Uh, can we be kind of leaning into Friedman with and and his assumptions on being able to rationally price in in a world of behavioural economics? I think so. Friedman, while I'm absolutely not, um, I, I think there's a lot of emissions in Friedman, and most of my, my book is to try to explain why you can't apply the Friedman principles. I do think Friedman still gets you um, quite far. It might get you to eighty to ninety percent. I think the final ten to twenty percent is still important. That's why I wrote the book. But why is the idea of you can't price things? Why, why I think Friedman does still take that into account is 
he says the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits while obeying all laws and obeying ethical customs. So if there's things which are not priced because there are externalities, well, he says, well, the government should deal with that through taxes. And why is it good for the government to deal with it? Is the government is democratically elected. So um, if it's only investors who are deciding about which externalities to care about, it may be that you argue for really rapid decarbonisation and you don't actually care about the loss of jobs of those who are working in the fossil fuel sector who may be 50 years old and can't retrain. Why? Because they might not own most uh, a lot of stocks. It might be the one percenters who are re represented by capitalism. Whereas with the government, they're democratically elected and everybody has the same, um, ha has, has one vote. Um, so unpriced externality should be dealt with a government. Now, should. Governments are not perfect. Are there things that you can't fully regulate? Well, this is why he says things like ethical customers. So there's, there's customs as to um, prompt payment of suppliers and so forth. And there are many companies who will do this rather than waiting until um, the final potential date. Um, I'd like to go b back um, a little bit uh, to an article that, that you, you referenced earlier on the end of ESG. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's got a really kind of uh, nice quotes in here that uh, ESG is both extremely important and nothing special. Mm -hmm. Now, I found this really interesting because I largely agree, but I think climate, the particular, like, particular parts or subsets of climate, mm -hmm. I find really hard to say that it's, um, it's nothing special because mm -hmm. it's, it's like existential. Mm. Uh, it's urgent, mm. um, and well, I can I can see the argument in uh, like in, in, in governments and certain 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 parts certain parts of the other parts of ESG. Mm. For particular for the climate bit, I've, I do I find it hard to to say no. It's it's extremely important, yes, but nothing special. Yeah, and I really appreciate the challenge. As that, as that <laughs> when you said you largely agree, I thought great. If you largely agree, that means there's something that you disagree with, and so there's something that I can learn from in terms of your disagreement. So this is an article called "The End of ESG." So first, this this title might jar with uh, many of the, the the viewers. Is I'm an ESG advocate. Why do I call it the end of ESG? Well, this now dovetails to behavioural economics. So Dick Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize, wrote an article a couple of decades ago called "The End of Behavior." finance. You might think, well, that's strange. Why is one of the leading lights in the topic wanting to end it? He said, no, I want behavioural finance to be seen as so mainstream that it's not a separate subfield, right? To understand the price of a stock, you need to understand cash flows and dividends, but also investor psychology. And this is the same with the end of ESG. I'm saying, well, it's nothing special um, because it's something that everybody should take into account. If it's seen as special, then it might be seen as something only for ESG investors. But as we've talked about throughout this conversation, it's something that just a, a rational business person should be um, mindful of. Now, your, your final topic is that, well, there are certain things where which do make it special. Why? Because my last statement was just from the perspective of an investor wanting to maximise value. But for society, ESG is special. Well, certainly climate is special because it's existential. And I agree with this, but this again goes back to my earlier statements that these are then things which need to be dealt with by governments and wider society. So there's other issues which are special, let's say um, illegal narcotics, let's say um, murder and crime and so on, and you're not going to um, fully be able to rely on, on companies to address those issues, right? Because if companies were allowed to set up um, with, with cocaine, well, they, they would set up because the economics of that situation are there. Going back to your your, your um, and this kind of related point, uh, just bear bear with me. Uh, but going back to your your, your PhD uh, paper on um, the the value of employees and the value of treating treating employees well, and you displayed a very strong value. Um, and then over uh, ten years later, mm. um, the, it was repeated, mm. um, and the same type of uh, type of studies came out. The market mechanism should say that that it should have been priced in. Mm. That that you know once the knowledge is there, you should be you know, people yes. should should be should be following that uh, that and obviously you know, it, it hasn't been. One, why is that? And two, is there any lessons on, on the types of conversations we're talking about on on ESG and climate and, and looking after you know your your carbon footprint and the rest? Yes, yeah, so so, so um, the paper I wrote was published in two thousand and eleven. Um, a more recent paper was published in twenty twenty two, I believe, which extends the data to twenty twenty. 
and finds that in the 10 years since then, you can still earn alpha, which is surprising because you might think if I found a trading strategy which works by companies with high employee satisfaction, then that should go away because everybody should have done it and eroded the alpha. So why might this not, not, not be the case? Um, because a lot of the focus on ESG has actually not so much been on the S because people don't know how to measure it. Um, and if they were to measure it, they might measure things like the CEO to worker pay ratio or percentage of diversity in the boardroom, not um, more intangible issues such as how employees are being treated. And so then what is the lesson for investors is that um, if you want to um, try to generate alpha, that's not the only motive for sustainability, but that's one motive. If you want to try and generate alpha, let's try to look at these intangible factors which are beyond just the metrics. Then you also ask, well, what are the implications for, for, for climate? And I don't think they are implications. I think this is really important because when often people find a study on ESG, they extrapolate from it and they say, oh, this is sort of proven that ESG works. No, my study does not prove ESG works because my study was purely an employee satisfaction. It does not have immediate implications to climate, which is something quite different. So often people treat ESG as just one big umbrella and any study which looks at sort of one little item about the umbrella, they then extrapolate from that to everything. Like I'd love to say that my, my study applies to every single ESG concept, but it doesn't. It applies particularly to employee satisfaction. So the implications I will draw will only be limited to employee satisfaction. Kind of spells out the difficulties that the whole ESG sector has. One of the um, kind of solutions that was kind of put forward were uh, various rating agencies, mm. ESG rating mm. agencies. And uh, But if you have a look at any given company, like mm. the, the correlation uh, between one rating and another is only 0.3. Like yes. that's, that's pretty weak. Um, how, how do we, well, how do you explain that and how do we get over that? Um, so people look at the um, low correlation between ESG rating agencies and say, well, this is a bad thing, right? Because if, if these professional rating agencies, if even they cannot agree on a company's ESG, then there's no hope for any investor. How can we invest in sustainable companies when we can't agree who they are? But I'd say, well, this is true for anything which is intangible. So let's say if there was a rating agency rating the quality of a company's management team, well, there would be disagreement because these are things which are really difficult to look at. So some people might look at certain aspects and focus on them more than others. As we've discussed, ESG comprises a myriad of, of many, many different things. Even if you looked at one specific issue, let's say female friendliness, how do we measure that? Percentage of women on the board, percentage of women in the wider workforce. Do we look at gender pay gap? Do we look at um, a, do you have a working mother or similar? Well, this, even if we agree that we should measure something, we don't know how to measure it. Second, do we even measure something to begin with? So is lobbying, is that a bad ESG issue because you're influencing the government, as you mentioned earlier? Or is lobbying sometimes submitting towards government inquiries? That's fine. So when off what the water regulator wants to have a new calculation for the cost of capital, like, is it legitimate for water companies to feed into that? Is that lobbying? Well, some would say it is. Some would say, no, that's fair. You're providing input into a consultation. And number three is even if we agree to measure different things, how do we weight it? Different people will have different viewpoints. And so the irony of why I find it so strange that people don't like this discrepancy is another way to look at divergence is the word diversity, which is an ESG issue, which many people think is being positive, right? You get more information from the fact that there might be six or eight different opinions out of there, rather than if everybody had to say exactly the same thing. And last question, um, just going back to your the second part of your personal uh, mission statement, which was uh, you want to inspire others. Mm -hmm. Is there any advice you could give to people who want to be trying to get um, others to reach the full potential? And I, I wish I had something which would sound sort of profound because this would be ending our conversation, but I don't really have something profound as much as sort of follow your passion and do what you truly, really um, are passionate about. Because often people think, let's strategize about these things. So when you are... Um, choosing a career, oh, I want to end up in career Y, so the stepping stone needs to be I can go from W and X and so on in, up to, in order to get to that point. But as Steve Jobs said in his Stanford graduation speech, you can't connect the dots looking forward. Um, you can only connect them looking backwards. So um, those of you who, who, who are listening or watching and who are interested in this for an academic career, I have an entire paper called 
the purpose of a finance professor, sort of how to find passion in research and teaching and these other activities. And even though that was something which is for specifically the academic profession, hopefully it's something that will apply to other professions as well, but to do things for intrinsic reasons rather than instrumental reasons. As we said throughout the theme of this talk, if you do something which is good for society, hopefully you will trust that the profits will follow. And I say the same as things is true for you at the career. If you do things because you enjoy it and you think it's having a positive impact, ultimately it would lead to financial success and security later on. Fantastic. Well, that was extremely profound. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so very, much. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.